Thank you very much, Sasha. I want to thank uh, the Clinton School for the invitation to come here, and I want to thank all of you for being here tonight as well. Uh, in view of everything that's happening around the world, uh, but in particular what's happening these days in Ukraine and Crimea, uh, I have to say your timing for this evening's talk is pretty good. Uh, on the other hand, this topic is relevant at almost any time because the point I want to make is that the relationship between Russia and the United States is really of enormous global significance. It is a relationship that I would argue is as vital as any relationship between two other nations on Earth. How the United States and Russia interact, how we understand each other, and especially how we avoid misunderstanding each other is a subject of existential interest not just to our own people, but to people all around the globe because of our combined nuclear might, if for no other reason. Simply put, America and Russia have a global obligation to manage our relationship in the most responsible way that we can. And managing that, that uh, relationship responsibly begins with better understanding. Now, I think most people have heard the saying, or the joke actually, that uh, Americans and, and uh, the British are two people who are uh, divided by a common language. In that same vein, I have come to see Russians and Americans as two people who are united by a common misunderstanding of our joint history. Russia and the United States have been dealing with each other, after all, for about 200 years now, over 200 years. Uh, the first American ambassador to Russia was a young fellow named John Quincy Adams, by the way. For most of the two centuries that Russia and the United States have had diplomatic relations, the dominating characteristic of that relationship has been peace, pragmatism, and trade. And in fact, there are some virtually unknown but fascinating episodes in our joint history that illustrate the peace and the pragmatism. Back in, uh, in 1775, King George II of England wrote to Catherine the Great, asking her to send a detachment of Russian soldiers, actually Cossacks, to help him in putting down the American Revolution. I think I said George II, I mean George III, obviously. Catherine the Great refused, saying she saw no reason to insert Russia in a dispute between England and its colonies. About less than half a century later, the United States returned the favor to Russia when we offered safe harbor to ships of the Imperial Russian Navy which were being harassed on the high seas by the British during the Crimean War. There was a Crimean War back in the 19th century as well. And there are examples similar to these that recur throughout our joint history. In fact, the ultimate triumph of the pragmatism and the peace I'm talking about came obviously during World War II, when America and Russia, the Soviet Union then put aside the deep ideological differences that divided us to come together as allies and together defeat Hitler in World War II. The problem is that for most of the last half of the 20th century, in other words, the period of history that most of us have in our living memory now, or some of us have in our living memory anyway, uh, the rivalry does not seem to be uh, the exception. It seems to be the rule, because we were bitter antagonists during the Cold War. The memories, the uh, images uh, of that period are vivid. The habits are ingrained, and they still exert a very powerful influence in both countries. And we can see those habits of uh, confrontation uh, in disputes between Russia and the United States that were in the headlines even before the current crisis in Crimea, even before the tensions in the relationship that we're seeing right now. Uh, you remember how Moscow blocked the adoption of Russian orphans by American adoptive parents in response to some cases where Russian orphans were actually abused by their parents in this country. Uh, U.S. Congress passed sanctions against Moscow officials who were implicated in the death in prison of a Russian whistleblower. American officials 
accused Russians of having blood on their hands because they vetoed a resolution in the Security Council which might have ended the Syrian civil war two years ago. The Russian government accused the government in Washington, in particular Hillary Clinton, the Secretary of State, of bankrolling street protests in Moscow. And the Duma passed new laws designed to curb the activities of human rights activists and foreign human rights and foreign social organizations. So what happened to the spirit of pragmatism and peace that I was just talking about? Is that just a relic of the 19th century? Are Russia and the United States actually fated to be antagonists? After two decades of cooperation following the collapse of the Soviet Union, are we witnessing something that historians will look back on someday and call the start of the second Cold War? Before we try to answer those questions, I think it's worth reviewing a bit of context as to why it's even valid to ask the questions in the first place. Now, I said earlier that the U.S. relationship with Russia is vitally important to the furtherance of peace and stability in our own country, but also peace and stability on a global scale. Some of you probably found that to be a fairly bold assertion at the time and wondered what the basis I have for, for making that assertion. So let me point to three things. Why the relationship between Russia and the United States is of special significance. The first relates to our interest in strategic survival nationally. Russia and the United States remain the world's only two nuclear superpowers. You can argue that Russia is no longer a superpower in many other ways, but it certainly is a nuclear superpower. Together, Russia and the United States possess about 95% of all the nuclear warheads on the face of the earth. Russia's nuclear arsenal is still substantial, and a lot of Russia's senior leaders today grew up in an era when contingency planning for the use of those nuclear weapons against the United States was a very real thing. It's what they trained to do. And in times of uncertainty or instability, people tend to fall back on what they were trained to do. And so for that reason alone, Russia, for us, can never be marginalized, can never be ignored. Russian cooperation is absolutely vital to us, I would say, at a time when proliferation of nuclear weapons and other weapons of mass destruction is a, glowing, uh, is a growing global danger. That was almost quite a pun there, a glowing, a glowing <laughs> global danger. Uh, and I should add, from Russia's perspective, a good relationship with the United States is essential for exactly the same reason in reverse. So that's reason number one. Just call it existential global self-interest. The second reason is basic geopolitics. Russia is a huge country. It spans nine time zones. It's a major international power that borders Europe, Asia, the Middle East, three regions whose stability is very closely tied up with our own security. Russia is a permanent member of the UN Security Council, and thus it has an influential vote, and yes, a veto, on the most crucial international questions that we face this century. Whether we're talking about nuclear ambitions in Iran or North Korea, terrorism and extremism in places like Pakistan or Afghanistan, or the consequences of political upheavals in the Middle East, we need Russia pulling with us on all of those questions in New York, in the UN, to make any progress. The third reason that Russia matters greatly to us, and this is a new reason over the last 10 to 15 years, is economics. Russia is now one of the top 10 largest economies in the world, and it's become a major market for American goods and services. Companies like Ford, GM, Boeing, Microsoft, ExxonMobil, Procter & Gamble do billions of dollars of business in Russia every year. Russia has and Russia will continue to have a major influence on how energy is produced and distributed in the world. Russia is the world's largest producer of oil and gas, and of course, the United States is still the largest consumer of hydrocarbons on Earth. Russia today, economically, is far more integrated into the global world than it was even 10 years ago, in a way that provides us important leverage as Europe and the United States began to look at levying banking and business sanctions against the Kremlin in response to their actions in Crimea and Ukraine. But at the same time, the Russia of today is very different 
from the country that I first visited as a student in 1976 when I went to Leningrad for a semester, or as a junior diplomat at our embassy in Moscow in the 1980s. Russia today is open to and connected with the rest of the world and with the United States in ways that were absolutely unimaginable just two decades ago. And the most conspicuous example of that is travel. Russians now make, on average, 35 million trips abroad every year, including more visits to the U.S. than ever before, double the number who came just a few years ago. Uh, I would uh, venture to say that there are probably three or four or five Russian students studying right now at the University of Arkansas, either here or in, uh, in Fayetteville. Uh, an entire generation of Russians, especially those students, people in their 20s and 30s now, have grown up accustomed to basic personal freedoms that didn't exist in the Soviet Union. Freedom of worship, well-established, churches and synagogues are filled, including with a lot of young people. The right to own and profit from a business, the right to buy and sell real estate, the right to move around the country and change jobs freely is totally normal in Russia today. 25 years ago, all of those things were considered criminal activities. And the most striking thing for those of us who remember the era of dissidents in the Soviet Union is the ability that Russians still have to express themselves freely whether it's through protests on the streets of Moscow or in blogs or in chat rooms. Russia is one of the top 10 countries in internet use in the world and over a third, it's actually getting uh, closer to a half of Russians are online regularly now on a daily basis. Democracy activists in Russia have used YouTube or the Russian version of it called RuTube regularly to expose and highlight corruption or fraud in elections. Up until now, the internet in Russia has not been censored to the degree that it is, say, in China. Now, there are some negative trends at work here at present. The, clear, uh, the Russian government right now clearly is seeking greater control over the internet, greater control especially over online news services and bloggers, and uh, we can talk about that in more detail maybe during the Q&A. The point I'm trying to make here is that the pervasive fear of the state that I encountered during the many years that I lived and worked in the Soviet Union is now largely gone. We're no longer talking about the totalitarian state that killed or imprisoned tens of millions of its own citizens in the 20th century and denied the rest the right to travel or to worship or to speak as they wished. And I find, now that I'm back from overseas, as I travel around the United States, as I go up on Capitol Hill, and talk to our elected representatives as I give talks like this around the country, that basic fact about Russia is still very poorly understood. People still believe that we are dealing with a kind of warmed over version of Stalin's Soviet Union. Uh, that's not surprising. It's a consequence of that powerful inertial memory that we all have of a time when we were adversaries, when we were enemies in a sense. And it's an important point to keep in mind now as we consider how Russians themselves are reacting to developments in their own country and whether we're on the brink of a new Cold War. Forget about how we feel about that. How do Russians themselves feel about that? That matters now in a way that was not true 20 or 25 years ago. So in sum, my argument here is that Russia is a country that we have a strong overriding national interest in trying to work with constructively, if we can. The problem is that relations between Moscow and Washington over the last 50 or 60 years have been cyclical to the point of making you dizzy sometimes. Periods of cooperation and confrontation alternate in rapid succession in a pattern unlike any great power relationship that I have studied in, in history. Uh, the World War II alliance, a unique alliance quickly replaced in the 1950s by the Cold War, by the Berlin crises, the, uh, the Cuban Missile Crisis that you talked about in the 1960s, gave way fairly quickly to a political thaw in the relationship that made it possible to start the nuclear disarmament process and led eventually to the era that we call detente, uh, 
at the time, in the 60s and 70s, between Nixon and Brezhnev. Ronald Reagan then enters the scene, calling and crusading against the USSR as an evil empire. Eight years later, he leaves the Oval Office, convinced and agreeing with Margaret Thatcher that Mikhail Gorbachev is indeed somebody that we can do business with. When I arrived as ambassador in Moscow in 2008, the relationship between the two countries was about as bad as I could remember it. It was at a new low point following the invasion of Russian forces into Georgia in August of 2008. Very quickly after that, for a number of reasons, including leadership changes in both countries and the global economic crisis, which hit Russia in particular in 2009, things improved very, very quickly to a period that is now looked at as or called the reset in U.S.-Russia relations. The reset was simply an effort to identify the main common interests that Russia and the United States shared and develop an agenda to advance them cooperatively and thus more effectively than if we went at them separately. And we achieved some concrete results uh, from that strategy that directly served American national interests. And I'll give you two quick examples of that. The first is the Treaty on Strategic Arms Reductions that we signed with Russia in 2010. The START Treaty continues the reduction in nuclear arsenals and launch vehicles that was started under Reagan and Gorbachev. And even more importantly, it maintains and builds on the verification regime that monitors the reductions and builds confidence between the countries. It's a very important achievement for both countries, obviously, and for our people bilaterally. But I would say it's even more important as a sign of common uh, purpose to countries like Iran and uh, North Korea that have ambitions to join the nuclear club on their own. We and the Russians can say, we're building down that nuclear club. We don't need you to think about joining it. So that was a big result of the reset, after a long period in which nuclear inspections were in abeyance between the two countries. A second big result was a dramatic increase in Russian support for US and NATO forces in Afghanistan. Under an agreement that was signed by both countries, hundreds of thousands of American troops and tons of military supplies have transited through Russia, refueling at a Russian air hub in central Russia to and from Afghanistan. Those supply routes assumed colossal importance when our relationship with Pakistan went through some troubles and we had no other way to get our supplies and our troops in. And obviously they will be extremely important, those transit routes, as we begin to pull our forces and our equipment out of Afghanistan in the next years. And despite the new tensions that we're experiencing now in the relationship between Russia and the United States over Ukraine, over Crimea, both the nuclear reductions and inspections under the START Treaty and this logistical cooperation on Afghanistan are continuing so far. Now, earlier, I mentioned that the strong economic interest we have developed with Russia is another critical factor of the relationship. And during the reset, we increased the volume of trade and investment between the two countries. Between 2008 and last year, trade between the US and Russia more than doubled. It reached an all-time high in 2011 of about $43 billion. Even if you factor in the downturn of the economic crisis 2009 to 2011 in Russia, American companies the ones that I mentioned earlier, Procter & Gamble, Ford, GM, have had 10 years of pretty strong growth in Russia that have added greatly to their own bottom line and created value for, for shareholders. While I was ambassador, to give you one example, Boeing concluded contracts to sell over 120 airplanes to Aeroflot and other Russian airlines, helping sustain about 30,000 jobs in the Pacific Northwest. Now, these are impressive numbers but you really need to look at them in perspective. America's trade with Russia amounts to less than 2% of our trade overall. Uh, if Russia went away, we really wouldn't even notice it that much. Russia's trade volumes with China, by contrast, are three times what they are with the United States. And with the European Union, 10 times, almost half a trillion dollars as opposed to $40 billion of US-Russia trade. So, if we're talking about leveraging economic sanctions to demonstrate 
to President Putin the costs of regional adventurism, then we need to ensure that the Europeans are pulling with us in that effort and not just looking to have their own companies come in and backfill when our companies, American companies, leave. Because overall, Russia is still a very, very challenging place to do business, despite the successes that I cited earlier. The combination of bureaucratic and administrative obstacles intertwined with an unbelievably pervasive level of corruption, especially at the local and regional levels, makes the risk premium for companies that want to enter the Russian markets very, very high. To take uh, one example that's relevant to this state, which uh, produces a lot of pork, uh, American meat and poultry have been among our biggest exports to Russia for the last 10 years. But we've faced constant pressure from protectionist forces in Russia from the agricultural sector that are obviously, as happens all the time, trying to keep our exports of pork and beef and poultry out of Russia. GM and Ford have suffered against similar trade barriers in the automotive sector. And it's difficult, very, very difficult, to describe or to overstate the negative, distorting impact of corruption in the Russian economy and in society as a whole. As one analyst wrote, memorably. In Russia, corruption is not the exception. In Russia, corruption is the rule. Ninety percent of Russians say they know how and when to pay a bribe, whether it's in a hospital, at a university, or simply to a traffic cop. The amount of the average bribe almost tripled over the last five to six years. And, and not surprisingly, when pollsters in Russia ask Russians what the most important problems facing the country are, and polling is a very good science in Russia and very reliable, corruption tops the list by a wide margin. 88% of Russians cite corruption as a top national problem. The best independent estimates from uh, Transparency International say that somewhere between 20 and 30% of Russia's GDP is lost annually to corruption. 81% of Russians agree with this statement. All of our government officials are corrupt. 81% of Russian surveys say, yep, I agree with that. So quite apart from losing 20 to 30% of your GDP from the substantial economic impact of this problem, it also has a hugely corrosive effect on any trust that the Russian people might have in the current leadership to be the source of solutions to the current problems instead of being the source of the actual problems themselves. This is the biggest problem that we face in trying to build a more constructive and productive relationship with Russia now. It is a lack of trust that exists between the Russian people and the people who govern them. And so once again, as has happened so often, in previous decades, we find the political relationship between Russia and the United States is dominated by disagreement. And what's the most profound area of disagreement that we have with developments in Russia? It is our concern over the very uneven pace and track record of Russia's democratic development and that lack of popular trust between the governed and the governors. I mentioned earlier that in a lot of ways Russia's never been more open to the outside world than it is today. Russians have never, agreed, uh, has never, have never enjoyed greater freedom to speak their mind openly. It's true, and in a fascinating irony, many of them use those freedoms and make use of the internet that has until now been relatively unfettered to criticize the shortcomings of their governments in other areas. I read these online, I speak Russian, I read the online media a lot, and I especially read the comments afterwards, and the blogs. And what all this adds up to is a persistent demand for accountability from the people to their rulers. The bloggers complain about the close control of organized political activity that's designed to ensure the Kremlin's ruling party, United Russia, doesn't have any significant political competition. There are many online newspapers in Russia there is a move afoot now to, to restrict their ability to report freely. But up until now, they have criticized the main state television networks, which is where most Russians still get their news, uh, for very biased and one-sided coverage. The fact that tens of thousands of Russians took to the streets 
in 2012 to protest against a patently fraudulent parliamentary election in uh, December 2011 is a vivid reminder and served as a vivid reminder to the Kremlin that Russians want a political voice, that they want to help shape their own future. In response, unfortunately, the Russian government has sought to blame outsiders, and this is a, a very historically familiar uh, phenomenon in Russia. Foreign governments, foreign non-governmental organizations are responsible for Russia's problems, for influencing or even paying protesters. As uh, President Putin said, or at the time Prime Minister Putin said, Hillary Clinton had actually paid protesters to go out on the streets of Moscow in December, January 2012. And these same charges are now being levied against the West over what's happening in Ukraine, which is being widely portrayed in Russian state-controlled media as a dark strategy ultimately aimed at destabilizing Russia. Now, I heard these arguments lots, all the time when I was ambassador. And my answer to them was always the same. We, as Americans, have zero desire, zero interest in weakening Russia. A weak and unstable Russia, an unpredictable Russia for us, for reasons that I hope I made clear, is our worst nightmare. Now, in all of the countries of the former Soviet Union, and Russia included, the transition that they've made to that totalitarian state from that totalitarian state to a more free, open market society isn't smooth, and it comes not without setbacks, not without backsliding. We have to understand that as well. It's not a straight line, linear process. But I did live long enough in the Soviet Union in the 1970s and the 1980s in what was a morally bankrupt society at that time to be convinced that there can be absolutely no return to the worst excesses of the USSR, whether economically in terms of a command economy or socially in terms of rebuilding gulags. That road back, I'm convinced, is pretty firmly closed off. But the road ahead for Russia is not completely clear, not to us and especially not to many Russians. And so it is extremely important for us, especially at times of tension and challenges in the relationship for us to keep the lines of communication with Moscow open and to make clear to Russian leaders to, to tell President Putin and ideally to tell President Putin speaking in one voice with our European allies to amplify the message that this policy of pressure and intimidation and territorial seizure against Russia's closest neighbors will entail substantial economic and political costs. And those costs will make it impossible for President Putin to achieve his own stated goal of making Russia into a respected and prosperous global power. Now, I don't believe the current crisis, what we see happening in and around Ukraine and Crimea, is just another latest temporary downturn in this cyclical boom or bust cycle that I described earlier. It it's, feels like something different to me. It feels and it seems clear to me that Russia's current leadership is seeking to make a more decisive turn away from closer partnership with the United States and Europe on the basis of an emergent nationalist ideology that rejects partnership with Western institution, rejects Western values as any kind of a model for Russia. And we have, those of us who've studied Russia, and I'm sure there are many of you in this room who've studied Russian history, uh, we've seen similar periods throughout Russian history when the domestic conservative forces become stronger and seek to promote a Russia as a kind of unique, exceptional Eurasian civilization that plays by its own rules and regards the outside world, the foreigners, with suspicion and even hostility. In the past, you could succeed in pushing that ideology, that mythology on the people because it depended on the state's ability to wall its people off from the alternative realities of the world. And that was much easier to do in the 19th and even the 20th century. 
But I don't believe that the realities of this century, the 21st century, in which a generation of Russians have come to regard open access to information, the freedom to speak and travel as a right and not a privilege, with that corpus, that body of young Russians, Russians who understand the world in a different way, it simply is not conducive to the shuttered view of the world that many people in Russia referred to as our imperial nostalgics. The reason that democratic institutions in Russia have been slow to evolve over the last 20 years is not because the Russian people or Russian society as a whole is incapable of embracing accountable governance. It's because of the lack of trust that the Russian leadership has in its own people. And that lack of trust is at least as strong as the lack of trust that the people show in their leaders. None of this amounts to the return of a new Cold War because the openness of Russian society today and the country's strong economic integration on a global scale, that strong trade relationship between Russia and Western Europe and China, all of those things tie Russia into the outside world in a way that really preclude a repeat of the first Cold War. The problem, as I said, is that internal gap of trust. But as I said, I've lived and I have worked in Russia for much of my career. I still visit Russia a fair amount, even as a retired Foreign Service officer doing some of the work I'm doing now. And I can say with, with some confidence that the laws of history and of the future are on the side of the people in Russia who are governed, on the side of the Russian people. That said, I do think we're in for a period of tension and uncertainty in the political relationship with Russia for the next several years. At least there are a lot of issues here that I haven't touched on at all, and I'm happy to address them in the Q&A session afterwards. But my longer term prognosis for Russia still favors a return to that pragmatic self-interest that really still has been historically the rule in the relationship we've had with Moscow, and not the exception. Thank you very much for your attention, and I'm happy to try to answer your questions now, because I hope you have a lot of them. We do have time for some questions. If you raise your hand, we'll get a microphone to you right here. Uh, could you address the uh, geographic changes that occurred during Khrushchev's time down in this country, the, the, the Ukraine and what was uh, the Crimea, separate then and maybe going to be separate again from uh, mm -hmm. the country of the, the Ukraine? Mm -hmm. You have to really go back even before uh, Khrushchev to the time of the uh, Russian Empire when you can go back to a period when uh, Moscow was a village and Kiev was the center of something called Muscovy. Uh, the links between Russia and Ukraine uh, go back almost uh, a millennium. And the uh, closeness of language, the shared religion, Russian Orthodoxy, make these two very, very close peoples, let's say. When the Soviet Union uh, was formed, Ukraine became one of the constituent republics of the Soviet Union, just as Georgia and Latvia and uh, Russia and Turkmenistan did. Uh, in 1954, Nikita Khrushchev, who was then the post, one of the post-Stalin tri uh, triumvirate, uh, who was governing Russia at that time, the Soviet Union, gave to Ukraine a part of uh, uh, Russia called Crimea, which had never really been part of Ukraine proper, although it is contiguous with Ukraine. But that, in 1954, in the context of something called the USSR, was a little bit like redrawing the border uh, between Wisconsin and the Upper Peninsula of Michigan. It really it didn't have a lot of practical effect until the Soviet Union fell apart. And when the Soviet Union fell apart, suddenly, that part of Crimea, which had been gifted to Ukraine in a very unusual way by Khrushchev in 1954, suddenly became a bone of contention between the two countries. Russia, 
made a pledge by signing an agreement in the 1990s that it would respect the territorial integrity of Ukraine in response for Ukraine giving up the nuclear arsenal that it inherited from Russia when the Soviet Union fell apart. But in moving into Crimea now, as President Putin has done, in annexing Crimea from his point of view and from the point of view of about 90% of Russians surveyed, he's just basically reclaiming something that Russia lost by accident uh, in a very unusual and illegal way in the 1950s. That's the Russian point of view. I mean, our point of view, obviously, is this, this is a violation of international law. You change borders not by force, but by negotiation. Yes, ma'am. Thank you for coming. Uh, would you say something about Ukraine and in contrast to the other former Soviet republics? For instance, in Kazakhstan, even though the Cosmodrome is still there, Nazarbayev seems to have kept Putin out of his business. Um, is this just a matter of weak leadership in Ukraine, or we ex can we expect to see this happen in other former republics? I would not expect uh, to see Russia embark on a wave of uh, revanchist efforts to reclaim uh, parts of the old uh, Soviet empire. Um, yes, there are many Russian speakers and ethnic Russians who are living in all of the countries of the former Soviet Union that are now independent republics. They're, uh, in the capital city of Latvia, Riga, the population there is almost 50% ethnically Russian. Uh, but it's, I think, unlikely that uh, uh, President Putin, the Russian military, would go in and try to reclaim those by force. Kazakhstan is a huge country with a lot of oil wealth, which has a substantial Russian-speaking population, but has large sections of steppe which are basically uninhabited. Uh, I think the leaders of Kazakhstan, of Belarus, of Central Asia, realize that by maintaining a good relationship with Russia and by managing their own countries, governing their own countries in a responsible way, uh, and by enjoying the support of their own people, they make it more difficult for Russia to even think about having designs on them. Ukraine is different in that respect because Ukraine has been catastrophically misgoverned for the last 20 years. Uh, the amount of theft and corruption that I described going on in Russia is large, but in relative terms, I would say small compared to what has happened in Ukraine over the last 15 years. Uh, it's a very, very sad state of affairs for the Ukrainian people who have deserved better leadership, but they, they did not get it. And Russia, one of the reasons that President Putin sites for going into Crimea and for wanting to protect Russian speakers in East Ukraine is that the central government in Kiev hasn't shown the capability of actually governing and controlling things in the country. It's created a pretext for him, in essence, to do what he has done. It doesn't excuse it, but it certainly uh, gives him a reason that he himself cites many times. Yes, sir. Compare and contrast the Russian actions in Georgia within you, with Ukraine. I was in uh, Moscow. Uh, I had just arrived in Moscow as ambassador in 2008 when the Russians went into Georgia. <clears throat> the uh, similarities, I think, are that in both cases, Russia felt that a state which used to be part of the Soviet Union on its borders was being, I'm explaining the Russian point of view on this, was being unduly and dangerously influenced by the West. In the case of uh, Georgia, perhaps uh, leading to membership in NATO. In the case of Ukraine, perhaps leading to membership or closer, closer association with the European Union. Uh, the difference is that in Georgia in 2008, the Russians provoked the Georgian leadership into essentially firing the first shot 
in that brief war that went on for about a week, Russian forces came in and occupied two breakaway provinces in Georgia, south of, south of Ossetia and Abkhazia, that had wanted for a long time to break free from Georgia. They didn't want to be part of Russia, but they wanted to be independent and free. And Russia supported them and, and recognizes their independence to this day. But Russian forces withdrew uh, in the main from Georgian territory, although they are still present in those two parts of Georgia that are contested. Uh, Ukraine is a slightly different situation because the reasons that Russia gave for going into Crimea in the first instance uh, by most independent assessments were trumped up, were fabricated. There were no large-scale attacks on the Russian-speaking population in Crimea. Russians comprise a, a, a majority of the people in Crimea, in fact. Uh, so there is much less of a, of a rationale that stands up to scrutiny for the movement of Russian troops into uh, Crimea. Of course, they weren't even called Russian troops at the time. President Putin admitted in his press conference last week that indeed they were Russian forces. But uh, the, the basic difference between those two situations, I think, is that uh, uh, in the latter case, in the case of Ukraine, the Russians moved in on you know, what was essentially a, a very bogus pretext. And we still don't know uh, what the end game of that will be. We know that uh, probably Crimea will not be rejoining Ukraine anytime soon. What will happen the, in the eastern provinces of Ukraine, in Donetsk, in Kharkiv, in Lugansk, will depend, I think, in large part on the resolve of the international community and the Russian leadership's own calculation as to what the costs of further encroachment, uh, further violations of uh, Ukrainian sovereignty will be. Oh, that student right there. Um, there's been continued violence in eastern Ukraine between the Ukrainians and the pro-Russian forces who have been um, aided by the Russians. And if Russia were to get more involved and in, if there were a civil war in, in any other countries that this happened, would, um, what would the West response be? Would they get more involved or just uh, make more sanctions? Well, I think until now, uh, it's been fairly clear from both the statements of European leaders and from President Obama that the likelihood of uh, military intervention by the U.S. or by Western armies uh, in response to a uh, civil war, to the outbreak of war in Crimea, uh, in uh, Ukraine, is not very likely. And interestingly, I saw a poll that just came out today from uh, the Pew Research Organization that showed that more than half of Americans surveyed think that American boots have no place on the ground in Ukraine. They support economic sanctions to, to push against that. We're in a new world. We don't yet know the degree to which Russia's intertwining with the global economy that I described earlier will actually serve as a disincentive for further encroachment into Ukraine. And I would say also that as uh, Russia looks at its options here, uh, it's much more difficult to administer, to annex and administer three provinces of eastern Ukraine, which are very mixed in terms of ethnic Russians versus ethnic Ukrainians, versus Crimea, which is pretty strongly pro-Russian. Uh, so I think it's probably unlikely uh, that we would see military action by the West in response to further encroachment by the Russians into uh, Eastern Ukraine, but I think the economic consequences of that really have yet to be fully felt by the Kremlin. The United States only announced today a third tranche of sanctions against individuals and some Russian entities. The European Union will make an announcement of its own tomorrow on its own third tranche. So there's still, I think, a lot of space for economic pressure and, frankly, for diplomacy, uh, short of uh, an actual shooting war. Alia. Uh, 
Thank you so much, Ambassador, for coming to the Clinton School. I'm a Clinton School student, and my question for you is really to understand how, um, how Russia's response, really, to the Syria situation kind of factors in and what that means, like what that relationship is and why um, it's chosen the stance that it's chosen in that situation. Um, if you could speak to that a little bit, that would be great. In other words, what is the Russian motivation? What is President Putin's motivation? Right. What is the motivation for its stance on Syria? On the, for its stand on Syria. Oh, Correct. sorry, I missed that. Well, Syria has been another issue where the United States and Russia have had more disagreement than agreement over the last three years. I was still ambassador in uh, Russia in 2011 when the Syria civil war really first broke out. And we worked very hard at that time to get the Russians to vote with us in the United Nations on a resolution that might have stopped that war before it turned into what it's turned into now. Uh, Russia's view on Syria has always been special. Uh, if you look at the Soviet Union's relationship with uh, the Middle East, it had a lot of client states. And most of those disappeared after the Soviet Union disappeared at the end of uh, the 1980s. There were exceptions. And Syria really remained as one of the last client states of Moscow in the Middle East to this day. President Assad, the son, uh, is considered a close ally of Moscow. Uh, Syria has been a major purchaser of Russian arms exports. They don't have a large market around the world for their armaments. Uh, their market has been shrinking. Uh, but I think most importantly for the Russians, the principle of non-intervention, and this is extremely ironic, the principle of non-intervention in the sovereign affairs of other states was a guiding principle for President Medvedev and President Putin to stand up and say to the United States, stop, you have no right to depose the elected president of Syria. Those arguments ring a little bit hollow now in light of what we've seen happen in uh, Ukraine. And frankly, uh, Russians Russians' arguments about Kosovo, blaming the United States for a unilateral declaration of independence for Kosovo and the Europeans for supporting that, also are much more hard to sustain now, look hypocritical in light of what Russia has just engineered in Crimea. With regard to Syria, our one moment of common purpose was last summer when we agreed to work to get Assad to get rid of his chemical weapons stock. Uh, that process is continuing. It hasn't moved as fast as we want, but it hasn't been the abject failure that everyone had uh, predicted as well. Uh, but I think in the current environment, when the relationship between Moscow and Russia is as bad as it is, the likelihood that we can find any common cause on, say, a new Geneva peace conference to bring the warring sides to the table looks fairly unlikely. We're, I think, going to have to hit pause on the diplomatic efforts for a while. And unfortunately, no one inside Syria is hitting pause on all the death and destruction that's taking place. There's never a good time to end this. There's at least 20 more questions that had their hands up immediately when we started. So please do come up afterwards and, and continue this conversation, because there's obviously still questions to be asked. Ambassador, thank you so much for coming. Thank all of you. Thank you. Now I can look at it. Just a, a quick thank you for the funds we raised beforehand. We raised almost $1,000 just tonight, and we're going to do this four more times can I, this week. Can I, don't, can I donate it? Yes, yes, please. Okay. Um, and so thank you again, and if you have any uh, questions, please come up.